Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. This is the um, SAEM Pediatric Emergency Medicine Interest Group uh, virtual presentation of the top abstracts from the SAEM 2020 that due to COVID, we weren't able to really feature as well as we would have liked to. So I would like to really thank our speakers and panelists for being able to make time and coordinate to be able to participate in this session. We're going to do a two hour session, six speakers. Um, each of them is going to do their presentation followed by a Q&A session and then we're going to kind of go um, in order. The order will be the same order as the list that was presented to you guys when you first registered. So a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we were going to leave chat open, so you're welcome to use the chat function. I would request that you guys not use the chat function for having um, other off-site conversations, but rather use it to ask questions for, the, uh, for our speakers. I will be monitoring the chat um, and we'll be able to ask your questions through there and I'll, I'll pass them on and ask the questions for you. And um, some of the speakers themselves will also be monitoring the chat. Um, some of you guys um, have done probably 2,000 hours of uh, Zoom RID. So you guys all know that uh, it's important to keep your microphones off so that we don't get a lot of interference. And um, one last thing is that we will be recording this. So uh, it will be available for asynchronous viewing. Also, I understand that this is going to be live streaming at the same time uh, via Facebook. And um, where else, Holly, is it going to be streaming? On YouTube and Facebook. On YouTube. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, pass it on to our first speaker, Dr. Sage Meyer from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Yes. Um, and she's going to be talking, talking about frequency risk factors and associations of acute kidney injury in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis. Thank you so much, Sage. Your stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sage Myers, and I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I'm here on behalf of the entire study team to present our work evaluating frequency, risk factors, and associations of acute kidney injury in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. This project is the culmination of an amazing amount of work and dedication of multidisciplinary teams across 13 sites, and I want to express my sincere gratitude for all of those involved. All right, now it's going forward. <laughs> DK in children has been associated with organ injury at frequencies higher than previously recognized. In particular, subtle cerebral injury in DKA has been noted to occur commonly and result in long-term cognitive alteration. Although the mechanisms are still being investigated, there's evidence for both hypoperfusion, reperfusion injury, and inflammatory changes. For some reason, it doesn't want to go forward. Hold on, let me see if I can do it this way. Ah, there we go. Uh, a recent small retrospective study found that acute kidney injury, or AKI, also occurred commonly during DKA. Associated risk factors in the study found that um, included a low serum bicarbonate level, hypernatremia or tachycardia, uh, which all suggests more severe dehydration and acidosis may play important roles. The underlying etiology, however, remains unclear. If AKI occurs frequently in DKA, it's possible that common mechanisms could underlie injury to the kidney, brain, and possibly other organs in pediatric DKA. The more we explore the risk factors for injury and associations with injury development across different organs, the better we can understand these possible common pathways and develop targeted treatments or interventions to prevent organ injury in pediatric DKA. This is particularly important given the potential of long-term ramifications of acute kidney injury and possibly other organ injury as has been demonstrated with cerebral injury. Therefore, we set out to evaluate the frequency of and factors associated with AKI using data from a large multi-center prospective study of children with DKI. We also aim to explore the possible associations between AKI and brain injury in pediatric DKI. We hypothesized that AKI occurs frequently in pediatric DKI, including subtle renal injuries and may be associated with cerebral injury. 
This is a planned secondary analysis of the peak current fluid trial. The fluid trial was a large multi-center prospective study evaluating the effects of fluid rehydration rate and sodium content on neurocognitive outcomes in children with DKA. These results have been published, finding no significant difference in either rate or sodium content of rehydration and the development of cerebral injury, leaving open the question of what causes brain injury in pediatric DKA. The fluid trial included 1,389 episodes of DKA, which included 1,255 unique patients younger than 18 years old. Inclusion criteria for the fluid trial included age less than 18 years old, with DKA defined as a blood glucose greater than 300 and a venous pH of less than 7.25 or bicarb less than 15, as well as serum or urine ketones. Exclusion criteria included conditions unrelated to DKA that could affect mental status or cognitive abilities or substantial treatment for DKA prior to arrival to the study centers for patients who were transferred. During DKA, mental status was assessed hourly using the Glasgow Coma Scale, and short-term memory testing was done every four hours while awake. Clinically apparent cerebral injury was defined as deterioration in neurologic status, leading to initiation of hyperosmolar therapy or endotracheal intubation, or resulting in death. Long-term neurocognitive outcome measurement was done two to six months after the DKA episode and included long-term and short-term memory testing and IQ testing in children three years and older. For this secondary analysis, AKI was defined by the kidney disease improving global outcomes creatinine criteria. Since baseline creatinine values were not available for most episodes, an estimated GFR of 120 was chosen to calculate baseline creatinine levels consistent with previous studies. We use the maximum serum creatinine measured during DKA to designate the acute kidney injury level with stages one, two, and three, as defined by the kidney disease improving global outcomes criteria. Of 1,389 DKA episodes in the main peak current fluid trial, 1,359 were included in this analysis. 28 DKA episodes were missing data on patient height and, missing, and two missing creatinine values, and these were excluded. Patients were equally distributed across arms of the randomization structure. Of the 1,359 DKA episodes included in the analysis, 584 developed acute kidney injury. 94.7 of those who developed acute kidney injury had evidence of AKI on presentation, but 3.8 developed AKI after treatment initiation. Of those who developed AKI after tr treatment initiation, 10 were in the slow rehydration group and 12 were in the fast rehydration group. Timing of AKI was unknown in nine patients for whom the first documented creatinine was more than two hours after treatment initiation. The maximum AKI stage reached was stage one in 332 or 56.8% of patients, stage two in 36.8% of patients, and stage three in 6.3%. AKI stage worsened during DKA treatment in 16 cases, which is 2.7% of those who developed AKI. Seven of these were in the fast rehydration group and nine in the slow. No patients required dialysis. Using multivariable logistic regression model to estimate the adjusted association of demographic, clinical, and biochemical factors with AKI, we found significant associations between AKI in older age, higher age-adjusted heart rate, BUN, glucose-corrected sodium, and glucose concentrations, as well as with lower pH. There was no significant difference in AKI during DKA in the adjusted analysis by sex, new onset versus existing diabetes history, baseline bicarb or baseline PCO2. The frequency of GCS decline among those with AKI was 5.9%, and among those without AKI was 1.8. However, using multivariable modeling, we found no significant difference in the frequency of GCS declines between AKI groups, nor in the magnitude of those GCS declines. We did find a significant difference, however, in several neurocognitive factors. Forward digit span recall performance was significantly worse among those with AKI. Backward digit re span recall was also worse in the AKI group with a difference between groups approaching significance at a P of 0.06. In long-term neurocognitive evaluations, IQ was compared between AKI groups using a mixed linear regression model that included random effects of enrolling hospital and found a significantly lower IQ among those with AKI. With a new onset population, when the new onset population was compared to the population with previously diagnosed diabetes, we found that the IQ was significantly different between those with and without AKI in patients with new onset diabetes. Therefore, the difference in IQ found appears to be primarily driven by an effect found among those with a pre without a previous history of diabetes. Our study has several limitations. First, the timing of blood sample was determined clinically and varied across patients, with creatinine frequently not measured after acidosis resolved. Therefore, some cases of AKI may have been missed and others occurred earlier than detected. 
Also, baseline serum creatinine measurements were not available for most patients. Therefore, we used GFR estimation to determine these. Sensitivity analyses using lower estimated GFRs of 110 and 90 yielded lower estimates of AKI frequency, but similar association fit analysis. Finally, the use of potentially nephrotoxic medications during hospitalization and as scheduled med medications prior to DKI were recorded, but documentation of medications taken prior to arrival that were not scheduled meds was incomplete. Therefore, we cannot fully exclude the contribution of nephrotoxic medication use prior to presentation. However, this use is generally uncommon in this population. Patients who reported receiving a medication with possible nephrotoxicity prior to the detection of AKI occurred only three of the 584 episodes of AKI, and all of those had stage one. In conclusion, AK, acute kidney injury is common in children with DKI, occurring in 43% of all DKI episodes. In addition, 43% of those children who develop AKI met criteria for stage two or stage three renal injury, suggesting intrinsic tubular injury beyond pre-renal azotemia. AKI was more frequent among children with greater acidosis and greater circulatory depletion. Interestingly, these factors are similar to those found to be associated with cerebral injury during pediatric DKI. In addition, children with AKI had higher frequencies of subtle cognitive impairment during DKI. And even after recovery from DKI, long-term IQ differences between patients with and without AKI persisted, despite adjustment for DKI severity and demographic factors. This suggests that acute kidney injury could exist as a pattern of multi-organ injury in the setting of DKI. I'd like to thank all of the authors, the research coordinators, the multidisciplinary liaisons at each site, and the PCARN Emergency Care, the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, without whom this study would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sage. Really, really appreciate this. Um, I don't have anything in the chat area. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Myers about this study? Okay, so one question I was going to ask you about this um, um, in terms of uh, the emergency physicians management of uh, DKA and potential steps that one could take to prevent any further contribution to acute kidney injury. What, what are some of the things that clinicians can look into doing early? In order to prevent acute kidney injury? Or, or to prevent its further exacerbation if already not developed. I mean, I think that that's still definitely an open question um, and one that we uh, really need to start to look into. I think it's exciting um, and interesting that there could be a common mechanism in the injury that we see happening in the brain um, and in the kidney. And I think that that's something that we need to explore. Um, in the brain, there's evidence of um, hypoperfusion, reperfusion, as well as inflammatory changes. Um, and so, you know, hypoperfusion, reperfusion, we could think about more aggressive rehydration. Inflammatory changes makes you think that there may be some other medical treatment that you could do to help prevent some of the injury that's occurring. But I think still that's open. So one question from um, Dr. Berkowitz from the chat is, was there any way to assess how many previous episodes of DKA the patient had previously experienced? We did collect that information. When we looked at patients um, in these models, we just separated into them into either um, no existing diabetes, diabetes, and then previous episodes of DK and not. Um, and that actually fell out of the model that we were creating to evaluate. So it wasn't the final analysis. Another question, uh, thanking you for the great work. Did flows, fluid bolus amount play a role in development of AKI? And that is those who received 10 versus 20 cc per kilo. There was not a difference in the numbers that were in each of those. Um, uh, whether they were, I, we didn't look at specific to did they get a bolus or not, but which arm of the study that they were in. That question was asked by Dr. Kelly Bergman. Um, any other questions? Okay. So we're gonna move on to the next speaker, Dr. Prashant Mahajan from University of Michigan. He's gonna be talking about prevalence of bacteremia and meningitis in febrile infant under 60 days with a positive urinalysis. The floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mo, for uh, arranging this and also 
to the SAEM, you know, the pediatric uh, special interest group. Really appreciate this. It required a lot of work from your side, and uh, it was such a proud moment. And I don't know whether uh, Nate. Uh, I just want to pull, put put out something there for Nate. Is um, we started working on this febrile infant in Pekarn in 2002. It's to 2020. The the concept when Nate was in that early. And the interesting thing is we've had multiple presentations, but this is the first forum that both Nate and I are presenting at the same time. So it took 18 years to do that. So thank you more specifically for that. Thank you, you guys, uh, for your time, for sure. Yeah. So anyway, so thank you very much for this opportunity to present our research pertaining to young febrile infants. We are really, really appreciative of the efforts taken by SAEM and as I mentioned to the pediatric SIG, you know, to sustain and highlight research activities during these uh, unprecedented times. Our research was supported by several federal grants and PCARN. Um, the prevalence of uh, important bacterial infections in febrile infants in the first two months of life is estimated at 8 to 10 percent. Most are due to urinary tract infections and rest due to invasive bacterial infections which are defined as bacteremia and bacterial meningitis. Experts recommend the use of various risk stratification algorithms in the evaluation of young febrile infants. And you will hear uh, when Nate does his presentation related to one of those uh, in the first two months of life and to specifically identify those at risk for important bacterial infections. Patients with positive urine analyses are at an unknown risk for invasive bacterial infections, especially bacterial meningitis. There are benefits and drawbacks to performing lumbar punctures in febrile infants. There is a balance, right, between the benefits of knowing for sure whether the patient has bacterial meningitis by performing lumbar punctures on every febrile infant versus the risk of failed or traumatic LP, iatrogenic complications, prolonged unnecessary antibiotics, parental anxiety, and societal costs. So our prior work, uh, we have demonstrated the substantial practice pattern variation in the performance of lumbar punctures, uh, which you'll see on the graph on the left, and hospitalization on the graph on the right in young febrile infants. The y-axis in these graphs represents proportion of febrile infants who received lumbar punctures and hospitalizations, and the x-axis represents the age by day of life up to 60 days. As you can see, LP and hospitalization rates are consistently 90% and above in the first month, and they drop to less than 50% in the second month across the 26 participating PCARN institutions. This was a paper that was published by Alex Rogers in 2019. Recent data estimates that the overall risk of bacterial meningitis in febrile infants in the first month of life with a positive urine analysis is at around 1% and substantially less than 1% in the second month of life. However, this evidence is still not very definitive because prior study designs you know, either have been retrospective in nature, have used varying definitions and have a selection bias as they have included only those infants that had LPs performed. So that brings us to the objective of our study. The objective of our study was to determine the prevalence of bacteremia and bacterial meningitis in febrile infants in the first and second month of life with a positive urine analysis. So we performed a planned secondary analysis on, it, on data collected for the parent study. And the parent study was a prospective cross-sectional study of febrile infants two months and younger in PCARN EDs from 2008 to 2019. We included infants less than 60 days of age with fever, which was defined as temperature 38 degrees centigrade rectal in the ED uh, or at the referring center or fever at home and who were being evaluated for their bacterial infections with a minimum of a blood culture. For this secondary analysis, the results of the urine analysis had to be available for the patients to be eligible. We excluded critically ill appearing infants, those who had received antibiotics within 48 hours, and those with histories of prematurity or complex congenital heart disease or complex associated heart disease. We then collected data on patient demographics, specifically including the Yale observation scale score, which as you know, is a quantifiable score for patient appearance. We also collected data on screening tests in the blood, including the white blood cell count, absolute neutrophil count, we also collected data on urine analysis and CSF analysis and cultures from blood, urine, and CSF. Serum, procalcit serum procalcitonin was analyzed if available. We then recorded the patient's treatment and disposition, 
and all febrile infants who did not receive a lumbar puncture and were discharged from the ED had a telephone phone follow-up call to determine bacterial meningitis status. We defined urinary tract infection, bacteremia, and bacterial meningitis using widely uh, accepted definitions. In the main analysis, we compared patient demographics, screening biomarkers, and prevalence of bacteremia and bacterial meningitis between febrile infants with a positive and negative urine analysis. We report our results stratified by two age cohorts, first and second month of life. We performed multivariable analysis to identify predictors of bacteremia and bacterial meningitis in febrile infants with a positive urine analysis. So in our results, for the parent study, we enrolled 7,400 uh, febrile infants prospectively in the parent study, and 97% of those, these infants had a urine analysis performed, and thus were eligible for the main analysis. Approximately 1,000 infants had a positive urine analysis, and approximately 6,000 infants had a negative urine analysis. The prevalence of important bacterial infections stratified by positive and negative urine analysis are shown in the bottom row boxes. Of note, there was substantially higher prevalence of urinary tract infection and bacteremia in the positive urine analysis group. Infants with a positive urine analysis were more likely to be younger and have higher mean temperatures. There was no difference, however, in the Yale observation scale score compared to those with a negative urine analysis. Additionally, infants with a positive urine analysis had higher mean values of WBC count, higher mean values of WBC count, ANC count, and serum procalcitonin, and they were also more likely to be hospitalized. This slide reveals the distribution of urinary tract infections stratified by age cohort. As expected, nearly 50% of the febrile infants with positive urine analysis had UTIs compared to just 0.7% with negative urine analysis. These results are similar between the two age cohorts. Overall, the prevalence of IBIs or invasive bacterial infections were higher in infants with positive urine analysis and these differences were similar in both age cohorts. Amongst IBIs, bacteremia rates were higher in infants with positive urine analysis in both months of life. As expected, the overall rates of bacterial meningitis were low in the entire cohort. Of note, among the febrile infants in the second month of life with positive UA, none of the 697 infants had bacterial meningitis. And this is the most important finding of our analysis. Our prior research had identified procalcitonin as an important predictor of bacterial meningitis. And since procalcitonin was variably analyzed across the PCARN institutions during the study period, we developed two multivariable models to identify predictors for invasive bacterial infections one in cohorts with procalcitonin and one in cohort without procalcitonin. So amongst the 470 febrile infants who had procalcitonin levels performed, only young age and procalcitonin levels were independent predictors of bacteremia and bacterial meningitis. Amongst the 1,047 infants who did not have procalcitonin levels performed, young age, temperature, and absolute neutrophil counts were independent predictors of bacteremia and bacterial meningitis. Our study has some limitations. We enrolled a convenience cohort of febrile infants based on research staff availability. However, we performed a separate analysis where we did not find any differences of bacterial disease prevalence in the missed eligible cohort. Second, there are overall very few cases of bacterial meningitis in the entire cohort which is re re reflective of the prevalence in this age group. And finally, PCARN EDs represent specialized pediatric centers and may not represent care provided in other settings. So in conclusion, uh, the prevalence of bacteremia is higher in febrile infants uh, in the first two months of life with positive versus negative urine analysis. So we suggest that serum biomarkers are necessary to assess the risk for bacteremia. 
there were no cases of bacterial meningitis amongst the 700 or so infants in the second month of life with a positive UA. So lumbar punctures are typically not necessary in this age group with a positive urine analysis. Uh, as you may see that in a couple of presentations, we are uh, presenting the validation of the pecan febrile infant prediction rule, uh, which includes the urine analysis and will give you a better, uh, will reflect better on this whole impl implications of the application of the uh, febrile infant uh, prediction rule in this population. Our next steps, we are planning implementation and wide dissemination uh, of our rule. And finally, uh, I would like to thank uh, personally to, to my co-principal investigators, uh, Nate and Octavio, uh, who've been my mentors and we've been together on this journey for the last 15 or so years. And to all PCARN site investigators, research coordinators, uh, and, and the data center. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, Prashant. This is, this is awesome. Um, any questions for Dr. Mahajan on this uh, very important study? Let me see if I'm looking through the chat here. Um, so I got one question here that's coming from Kurt. That's, let me just get, up, get to it. That says, uh, did you compare pneumonia to UTI in your book? Like between the two age groups or, uh, or? Because we have a separate analysis where we are looking at all febrile infants who were diagnosed with pneumonia in this cohort to identify what were the predictors uh, for those. Uh, but in this case, we just chose, and we have that analysis, which is actually ongoing. Uh, but in this particular instance, we looked mainly at urine because you know it's an easy to perform test, it's available, results are immediately available, and you can actually make decisions. Uh, and I, we believe at least uh, given the none, right? No cases of uh, positive uh, meningitis in the second month of life. Uh, the risk is so low that people may have to take that into their decision-making uh, 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 thought process, you know, whether to perform lumbar punctures or not in that age group. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, it, you know, it, the urine's easy to get, but also pneumonia is one of the things we're looking for. Kids. The pneumonia as a source did that have the same kind of an increase in risk that you saw with UTI? Yeah, so, so I mean, bacteremia. yeah, Curtin said the, the only reason the, those results are not being put up here because that analysis actually has been done. But a couple of things about pneumonia I can just mention is that it is a very interesting diagnosis, right? Um, in patients, in absence of any respiratory symptoms, whether you truly have a pneumonia or not is not clear. Two, Radiographic pneumonia versus non-radiographic pneumonia is an issue. And third, a lot of pneumonias, even if like a positive X-ray, quote unquote, could be viral in nature because that is the most common cause of pneumonia. And a separate analysis that we actually have results to amongst the 2,000 infants in the biosignatures two cohort, the, the, the last cohort that we have, right. we have results where it does show that the prevalence of positive viral tests in patients overall in febrile infants is in the up, upwards of 80% of, you know, instances. So pneumonia is going to be an interesting uh, analysis, right. but we have some of that coming up uh, fairly soon and Todd is leading that, uh, Todd Florin. Good. Okay. I'm not trying to get you to spill your beans. I just was wondering. <laughs> I'm trying my Thanks. hardest not to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Kurt. So, Prashant, there's a question also that from uh, Dr. Carol Borkowitz that Nate sort of answered, but um, could you tell how many infants had coexistent viral infection, whether that influenced the findings? And Nate responded that uh, for the project, we obtained comprehensive nasopharyngeal viral panels for all of the patients and results pending. Right, right. And so, so those results are pending, but I can just give you some sort of numbers from the first cohort. So around 60%, because it was not mandated, right, viral testing. So people were doing it based on the seasonal uh, 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 seasonal, seasonality and as well also the scope of the test varied from site to site. So like some people would only do RSV and flu, some would do a, a comprehensive screen. Uh, around 60% of those kids, were infants were tested and around 33 to 35% were viral test positive. Does that answer that question also? Yeah. And you know, it also gets to the point of, are we talking about a like 29 day old person who has fever, but no URI or anything like that. 
um, versus somebody who also has coexisting URI. You call it viral whether or not you test. Um, that's a presumed viral um, coexisting viral infection. Carol, is that what you're asking kind of? I don't know if you can respond. Uh, well, I was thinking that sometimes the, the, you would decide, oh, this child is RSV positive. I'm not going to, I found the source of the yeah. fever. And that sometimes is not the only source of the, the fever. So I, I think it's the question about a, a viral illness doesn't preclude there from also being a bacterial infection. Right. So, I, I was wondering if, if your um, data would substantiate that. Yeah, so the answer to that is yes, Carol, is because we have now over the last uh, 10 or so years, right, close to 7,000 infants that we have uh, enrolled. The interesting thing is in the second cohort, which is approximately 2,500 or so infants, we have performed comprehensive viral tests both on the nasopharyngeal swab and in the blood in all of them. Uh, and we have results of analysis of the nasopharyngeal swab in the 2000. You know, the blood is going to require extra money, so we don't have that those funds. What we can definitely, we have written a paper on that about coexisting viral infections. Uh, what we found that those who have a positive viral test, right, are at a lower risk of a bacterial infection, but the numbers for bacterial meningitis are so low anyway that there was no difference whether you have a positive viral test or negative viral test to make that to change your decision making. But the other interesting thing that I would just want to point out that different viruses appear to share a different risk. For example, if you have flu viruses versus rhinoviruses. Rhino awesome. Um, Prashant, there's a, a time, I guess, for another um, one or two. So uh, one question was, how were the urine culture obtained for these patients? Was there specific differences in the way urine culture was obtained? Yeah. yeah, so there was a guidance given. We asked the sites to perform the way they would perform. By default, close to 95% and above the urine was obtained by a catheterized uh, 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 collection method. In fact, very little or none from the suprapubic. Uh, those that were bag samples, we sort of excluded because we weren't sure exactly how to interpret. And we had developed a fairly complex algorithm, you know. Uh, and even within the urine cultures, for uh, positive urine culture to say whether the patient had a UTI, we had specific predefined criteria. And Andrea Cruz has actually written a paper uh, on, uh, on that, but I can bring up one second. I'm just pulling up the definitions. Sorry. Yeah, so we used these definitions, but I can in sort of summarize by saying that close to 95 or 97% were catheterized urine analysis. And we used this to define urinary tract infection. Okay, Prashant, just a couple of quick ones if you have time. Yeah. Um, so did the cohort include late preterm infants 34 to 36 weeks or only term infants greater than 37 weeks gestation? Only 37 and above. And the reason was not related to this study, but the, you know, the, the parent study is we're looking at host response to, um, to the presence of a infection. Uh, and we wanted to reduce all the other variables that can lead to an abnormal host response, which could be because of prematurity, coexisting, you know, immune deficiency diseases or complex uh, multi-system diseases, and even sepsis, like very ill patients who required to be intubated or support, we excluded those. Uh, so yeah, so the answer is our cohort ha has 37 and above. Okay, one final question from Deb Wiener. Um, thanks for the great work. Any sub-analysis sub of markers that distinguish CSF pleocytosis with positive versus negative CSF culture? So, so there, there, are, uh, uh, there are those analyses that are being planned, uh, but uh, what I believe is um, it is the host response which is going to be more uh, likely to be revealing rather than doing sub-analyses based on, you know, cutoffs with, um, with white cell count, uh, because especially a white cell count with a traumatic LP or with the coex, you know, if the culture has shown viral uh, growth versus non-viral, like enterovirus versus not. Um, so there is a couple of sub-analysis being planned from that perspective. Um, but the truth would be, I think, uh, in, the, in the host RNA response, which will help differentiate. 
Okay, thank you so much, Prashant, for an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to the next presentation, Dr. Nay Molino from SUNY Downstate Brooklyn, uh, presenting on Rochester criteria and Yale observation score in febrile neonates um, to evaluate invasive bacterial infection. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nay Molino, and I'm a Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellow at SUNY Downstate Medical Center at Kings County Hospital Center in Brooklyn, New York. I would briefly like to take the time to thank the Penn Interest Group of the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine for allowing me to present my research today. So today, I'm going to talk to you um, about the Rochester criteria and your observation scale score in febrile neonates to evaluate invasive bacterial infection. We have no financial interest to disclose today. So neonates defined as infants 28 days and younger are at highest risk for invasive bacterial infection. I mean, they pose great difficulty in clinical decision making for most healthcare providers. Uh, this is primarily because it's extremely hard to look at an infant in this age group and determine whether they have an invasive bacterial infection um, defined as meningitis or bacteremia versus a non-invasive infection such as the common cold. Therefore, current management is recommended to be very aggressive um, with a full sepsis workup to rule out meningitis or bacteremia. This evaluation includes blood, urine, um, cerebrospinal fluid testing, empiric broad spectrum antibiotics, and hospital admission. So why is all of this important? Um, as we all know, misbacterial uh, meningitis and bacteremia is associated with significant neurological sequelae and mortality um, in infants in this age group. Um, and many hospitals use 28 days as the cutoff for full, sep for full sepsis workups, regardless of how the neonate appears clinically. Um, there's been many studies that have been conducted to, to, find the, to define the best uh, criteria um, to identify febrile neonates at low risk of having invasive bacterial infection. And although protocols such as step-by-step -step and Rochester criteria have been created to help identify low risk um, infants, to identify low risk criteria for these infants, a significant number of these neonates are missed with invasive bacterial infection. So though distinction in age is very important, there is no single protocol, oops, sorry. There is no single protocol for the management of febrile neonates that, you, that it is universally adhered to in the United States. Therefore, the objectives of this study is twofold. One, to measure the prevalence of invasive bacterial infection defined as bacteremia and meningitis in febrile neonates. And two, to develop a low risk tool for evaluation of febrile neonates, combining the Rochester criteria, Yale observation scale score, and patient demographics. So this study is a secondary analysis of data that included febrile neonates from the febrile infant working group of, the, uh, of PCARN. The study population consisted of previously he healthy febrile infants 60 days and younger between December 2008 and May 2013. All of these infants um, had a documented fever or, and were evaluated, evaluated with diagnostic evaluation tests, which included blood culture and lumbar puncture for cerebral spinal fluid culture. The sample excluded infants that were less than 37 weeks, gestational age, infants who had antibiotics within four days of presentation to the emergency room, those with overwhelming clinical sepsis, chronic disease, or underlying illness. There were a total of 7,334 febrile infants, of which 1,524 met our inclusion criteria of age 28 days and younger. All of the neonates in this study had a blood culture, and 94% of them had CSF cultures. Um, we used receiver operator characteristics curve and decision tree analysis to determine if the operating characteristics of reassuring Rochester criteria, Yale observation scale score, and low risk Hmm, I'm wondering why it keeps changing on its own. I'm sorry, guys. Um, to determine the operating characteristics of reassuring Rochester criteria, low risk yield observation skill score and demographics were applicable as a combined screening tool for invasive bacterial infection. So the Rochester criteria is a set of low risk criteria used to identify infants unlikely to have um, a serious bacterial infection. Uh, the low risk criteria include that the child uh, appears generally well, is previously healthy, has no evidence of skin, soft tissue, bone, joint, or air infection, and has um, lab values that fall between a, spe a specific range for white blood cell count 
absolute band count, your analysis, and stool smear. The Yale Observation Skill Score was developed as a clinical score to help identify febrile children with serious bacterial infection. And the score includes um, assessment of the six characteristics that are listed on this slide. Um, for each of them, for each of the characteristics, the child's either given a mark of one, three, or five for normal, moderate, or severe impairment for a total score of 30, and a Yale Observation Skill Score of 10 or less to find the child as well appearing. For the purpose of our study, the Rochester criteria was modified to conform with the data um, that was given to us from the PCARN data set. So the Rochester criteria defined low risk urinalysis as a urinalysis with white blood cell, uh, with less than or equal to 10 white blood cells per high power field. Uh, we use less than or equal to five white blood cells as this was the cutoff reported by PCARN. And low risk for Rochester uh, stool analysis was less than five white blood cells in a stool sample. And we used um, no history of diarrhea as PCARN data set did not actually report on this value. Whenever there were values missing, a more conservative approach was taken. Um, and we assigned low risk values to maximize the inappropriate low risk stratification or decision tree analysis. As for outcomes, meningitis was confirmed by positive CSF culture and bacteremia was confirmed by a positive blood culture. When looking at demographics, our results showed that the median age of our study population was 19 days. 56.9% were male, 57% were white, and about a quarter were black or African American. The prevalence of bacteremia was 2.9% and meningitis was 1.5%. When we looked more at depth in age as a risk factor for meningitis, we determined that the optimal age cutoff was 18 days. Um, this just means that infants that were 18 days and younger were considered high risk in our study cohort. So we created a decision tree with application of our low risk criteria um, for identifying invasive bacterial infection. Our clinical decision tool combined reassuring Rochester criteria, Yale observation um, skill score, which is a score of less than or equal to 10, and age greater than 18 days uh, to identify neonates at low risk for invasive bacterial infection. And the next few slides will go more in depth, uh, more in depth with our decision tree. So starting from the very top of this decision tree, there are a total of 55 neonates of which 1,524 um, out of the 1,524 diagnosed with invasive bacterial infection. Of these, 11 had meningitis, 34 had bacteremia, and 10 had both. After applying the Rochester criteria to these 55 neonates, 24 were considered high risk as their white blood cell count was less than five or greater than 15, leaving 31 neonates. And then an additional six were actually excluded due to um, a, UA, a UA with greater than five white blood cells. This left a total of 25 um, neonates. So of the 25 neonates remaining, two of them were excluded as they were noted to have a soft tissue infection. Two of them were excluded um, for having diarrhea. And then two more were excluded for having bands greater than 1500. Um, with Rochester criteria applied alone, there were 19 patients incorrectly categorized as low risk with invasive bacterial infection. Four of them had meningitis, 12 had bacteremia, and three had both back, uh, meningitis and bacteremia. After application of the Yale Observation Scale score, um, an additional four neonates were considered high risk and removed from the sample. This left 15 incorrectly categorized as low risk. And then lastly, age greater than 18 days um, was found to be a risk factor um, and excluded an additional eight patients. So the remaining seven patients comprise of six febrile neonates with bacteremia and one with meningitis. We also just wanted to determine the prevalence of invasive bacterial infection in our low risk group. So of the 15, 24 patients in the study, 456 neonates met our low risk criteria. All 456 of them actually had a blood culture obtained and um, 423 of them had CSF cultures. The prevalence of bacteremia in this low risk group was 1.3% and the prevalence of meningitis was 0.24%, which is lower than the prevalence of the entire population, um, which was initially 2.9% for bacteremia and 1.5% for meningitis. So this table describes the neonates that were missed using our low risk screening tool of reassuring Rochester criteria 
low risk seal observation scale score in age greater than 18 days. Um, as you can see here circled, the single neonate with meningitis that was missed was actually 25 days old and initially had an indeterminate CSF culture, which was later um, classified as growing enterococcus. The six patients with bacteremia were class that were classified as low risk range from 20 to tw 27 days old. Um, blood cultures were positive for E. coli in about half of this population, and the other 50% were actually growing group B strep. None of the patients with bacteremia had a co-infection with meningitis. However, two of the three neonates with E. coli bacteremia had a concomitant, a concomitant urinary tract infection with the same pathogen. So this study did have some lim um, limitations. As the data was a retrospective convenient sample of neonates between 2008 and 2013, from the Febrile Infant Working Group of PCARN. Um, Though this data is seven years old, there's not been much change in practice, so the prevalence should not have been affected much. Given data limitations, we had to alter Rochester criteria. We redefined low risk urinalysis, and then we used no history of diarrhea as a surrogate. For any missing data, we assigned reassuring Rochester criteria values in order to maximize the number of patients inappropriately classified as low risk by our algorithm. This allowed us to test our clinical decision tool under the most conservative conditions. So in conclusion, age greater than 18 days and not 28 days is a low risk criterion that combined with Rochester criteria and Yale observation scale score can identify infants unlikely to have invasive bacterial infection. Neonates greater than 18 days who meet low risk Rochester criteria and have a normal YOS score may be carefully observed on the pediatric inpatient unit without a lumbar puncture and um, administration of, of antibiotics. These findings should be verified in a prospective study. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. That was a great talk. Um, so this uh, presentation is now open for questions. I see that, uh, Nate, you have a question for Nate? Yeah, uh, great. Hey, Nate, uh, very nice job. And one of the great things, by the way, about the PCARN work we do is that once a uh, certain time goes by, we open up these data sets for other analyses. And uh, Nate did a nice job um, using that opportunity. But I do want to uh, raise a word of caution so that uh, the Rochester criteria depend on band counts, and band counts were not available for the vast majority of uh, the patients in the peak carnival because most uh, hospitals do not routinely do band counts in these febrile infants. And um, neither we nor the step-by-step -step gang using advanced biomarkers have been reliable, have reliably been able to identify those with uh, bacterial, bacterial meningitis in the first few weeks of life. So I think it's, um, you know, given the lack of band count, which is fundamental to Rochester, you just need to do very careful statistical analyses uh, and your conclusions really need to be guarded because again, using advanced biomarkers, um, we still don't exclude the first few weeks of life. So just, just to be aware that, you know, we know the database really well. And there were, so and I guess the question is, what did you do for all the missing band counts? How, how did you adjust for that? Um, yeah, so initially we actually did contact PCARN because we did realize that a, a lot of band counts were either left, either said zero or they were left blank. Um, and so because we weren't quite sure what that means, if they were zero band counts or left blank, we decided to put them as, leave them in the group as um, high risk. So they were left in our decision tree analysis as high risk infants and they weren't excluded out using band count. And that's why very few were actually eliminated using the band count. So we left them in to take the most conservative approach. Yeah, and so I, I guess now all I'd ask is that, um, I don't know if you were working with a PhD statistician uh, because you know, we uh, looked upside and down uh, for this and again using you know, procalcitonin and whatnot. Um, and it's very tricky to identify a low risk group in the first few weeks of life. So very nice work, but uh, um, were, were you guys working with a PhD statistician on these analyses? We were working with a statistician um, who's at Kings County and Downstate. He's not a PhD statistician, he's, an M he's a DO actually. But he- so, uh, Yeah, good work, but just I would just say better really um, uh, tri double and triple check because uh, you found something that no one else has been able to, to find. So just needs very careful exploration. Yeah, and this is in a setting where everybody's trying to 
bring that 28 days to as lower as possible because nobody enjoys doing LPs on babies unnecessarily. Um, this, this is kind of going to be a big deal. You really need to prove a lot to be able to get people to come all the way down to 18 days, but it's a really great study. One question also from the field, um, can we substitute CRP uh, for the band, band count? Um, that's actually a good question. We didn't have enough results on CRP. Uh, we also initially wanted to look at ProCal as a substitute, but not enough um, in our data set for those dates. So we couldn't actually draw any conclusions using those values. So it'd be a good question to answer. Um, at Kings County and Downstate, we actually have already started um, not LPing our neonates 28 days and younger. What we do is we get labs, we get blood cultures, urine culture, and um, a year analysis. And if any of the lab values come back negative, and then we will then we will LP. If all of the lab values come back negative, we actually just admit those neonates um, for observation without antibiotics and LP. Well. Um, especially if the infants are well, well appearing, obviously, we would admit them and watch them. And so far, none of our neonates have actually been found to have meningitis who have been admitted under this criteria, which was a big deal for us. We wanted to use our patient sample initially, but the data just wasn't enough. Um, so we were unable to use uh, what we had. I believe we only had a few hundred patients, which wouldn't have been enough to draw many conclusions. And so that's how we ended up um, going with the PCARN data itself. But we do use ProCal and CRP as inflammatory markers for ourselves in our, in our hospital. So you're saying that there are potential somebody 23 days old who ends up um, having negative workup, as you would put it, and ends up not getting a LP, but getting admitted to the floor for observation. For, for observation, because the blood culture is still is still cooking, yeah. and so we just want to make sure the blood culture is still negative. Because even um, with this specific project, we did find that we did miss some bacteremia. But I think the big the big game changer here would be saying that you don't have to LP all of these neonates. Um, you can just get these labs observe them in the inpatient unit without an LP if all labs are normal. Um, so all labs do have to be normal. And if they are, we're saying that it's, it's potentially safe to admit these patients. Uh, for so, your, so your ward team and the ID service is on board with this at your institution? Yes, at our institution, yes. Okay, a um, couple of other, um, so Prashant, you say you have a comment to make? Yeah, I just, um, I think, you know, to that, um, uh, the less than um, 28 days, right, the first month of life, we just need to be a little bit more careful because um, the other aspect is HSV infections, right? And um, and I think we will have some, uh, Nate is presenting in his uh, work, but I think we really need to be careful about the younger age cutoff because also amongst the clinicians, there is a lot of discomfort as to in that young age group, right? So we need... Um, a large data, but I just want to add a comment about that, you know, because the prevalence of bacterial meningitis is so low anyway, that one would need to accumulate a large prospective data set, you know, to make some conclusions either ways. And uh, that is the reason why the PCARN study has been happening over the last 15 years is because we want to collect enough N positives, right, for bac bacterial meningitis. And one more, just to verify, these kids that you're admitting without an LP do not get antibiotics, right? No, they don't get antibiotics. And one last question um, from Mark Auerbach. Um, how many infants less than 28 days have you admitted? How do you describe, um, let me see, it just moved up on me. How do you describe the risk benefits of, to parents of this decision? So um, how many are getting admitted is the question how many of them are getting admitted in general? Um, Mark, are you asking how many admitted in general or how many of these ones that admitted without an LP? Sorry, I guess he's not um, able to respond. But I, I'm just... I guess I can just comment on what I think the question is asking. So for us, for all of our neonates, um, 28 days and under, they do get admitted um, just for observation, because we still have a blood culture cooking if they came in febrile. So if, if, the, if the patient was 22 days, came in febrile, was otherwise well appearing, labs were obtained, CRP, ProCal was obtained, and they were negative, along with um, negative 
other negative inflammatory markers, meaning if their LFTs are elevated, we would still tap this patient because it's an abnormality. Um, we would admit the patient um, without antibiotics for observation. And we do just explain to the mother um, our concerns, fair in age, um, the child is very young, we wanna make sure there's no um, bacteria growing in their blood. And most, patient, most parents are okay with that. Um, we do go in though, with a talk that they, they may be getting an LP because it's not, we don't want to get labs and it's abnormal and we start talking about an LP. So we, we talk about the puncture in the very beginning of the conversation. Um, and we say, according to what the labs show, it'll determine on whether or not your child needs an, a lumbar puncture. And so that's kind of what we've been doing. And so if their labs have all been normal, we then admit the patient um, just under observation or to the inpatient unit um, until they're 48 hours um, negative for their blood culture and they're, and they're able to be discharged home. If anything changes while on the floor, of course, they may, they may tap the baby. But the parents are made aware of that um, just so it doesn't come as a shock or a scare to them if anything changes. Okay, uh, Mark just added in here, can you have, do you have a sense of how many of these kids between 19 and 28 days have you admitted without LP? So unfortunately, I haven't combed through our data. Um, when I initially wanted to start this project, we probably had only a little over, this is about a year ago, only a little over 100. So we may be around 150, um, 200 now, but those that are above 19 days, I don't have that specific information. But I mean, I'm sure it'd be easy for me to do like a quick run in our Epic database just, just to see, and I could always try to get back to you with that answer. Okay, and one quick final um, question. Do you guys do what we call BioFire or a um, PCR on the CSF? We do. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Thank you again so much for the presentation. Uh, we're gonna move on now to the next presenter, Dr. Kelly Bergman from University of Minnesota, talking about diagnostic accuracy of point of care ultrasound um, in the diagnosis of intussusception, a multicenter study. Kelly? Unmute, can everybody hear me? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, so my name is Kelly Bergman. I'm a pediatric emergency physician at Children's Minnesota. And I'm going to talk to you today about the diagnostic accuracy of point of care ultrasound for intussusception. Sorry, just going to click through this. There we go. Uh, so the only disclosure I have is that one of our co-investigators, Dr. Ron Barant, provides consulting services to GE, but all other authors have no conflict of interest to disclose. And some common abbreviations that you'll hear throughout this uh, presentation are POCUS, which refers to point of care ultrasound. You may be more familiar with that. And also RADIS, which uh, we describe as radiology performed ultrasound. So intussusception is uh, the most common cause of bowel obstruction in children less than six years of age with approximately 40 cases per 100,000 live births. Uh, the gold standard uh, for diagnosis is radiology performed ultrasound or RADIS, uh, which had, has good sensitivity and specificity. Uh, however, sending patients to radiology can lead to delayed uh, emergency department throughput, uh, higher charges, and unnecessary transfers from adult facilities to children's hospitals for dedicated pediatric radiology services. Uh, point of care ultrasound uh, more recently uh, has shown reasonable sensitivity and specificity for the evaluation of intussusception and may alleviate some of these uh, concerns. To date, evidence evaluating uh, POCUS as a tool for the diagnosis of intussusception is limited to single center studies with small sample sizes. There's been one prospective study only uh, that has assessed test characteristics for POCUS uh, for the diagnosis of intussusception in children which had a sample size of 82 with only 13 positive cases. Uh, retrospective studies have been limited by selection bias. Uh, more recently, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis published looking at this population. However, this analysis included seven studies utilizing POCUS, three of which were abstracts, three were retrospective, and one was the uh, previously mentioned prospective study. So given the current body of literature, we sought to further study POCUS for the diagnosis of intussusception in children. 
Our primary aim uh, was to determine the diagnostic accuracy of POCUS for clinically important intussusception. We specifically sought to study clinically important intussusception, which we defined as uh, having provider clinical judgment that enema or surgical reduction would be required. For instance, the, the treating sonographer and provider felt that it was an ileocolic intussusception most likely. And in addition to that, they had to identify a maximal size and transverse diameter greater than or equal to two centimeters. Of note, diagnostic accuracy refers to the proportion of clinically identified studies divided by all study outcomes. And our secondary aim was to describe the time to diagnosis of clinically important intussusception uh, using POCUS compared to RADIS. Uh, to accomplish our aims, uh, we've conducted a multi-center non-inferiority study across 17 different sites in North America, Europe, uh, and Australia. And this figure shows the geographical representation of our study sites. A primary study team was formed among four investigators uh, and a biostatistician who is a PhD here at Children's Minnesota and collectively uh, we reviewed the literature, vetted the study protocol, and our sample size was determined to be 256 with the following assumptions that uh, radiology performed ultrasound or RADIS has a sensitivity and specificity of 98% using a power of 0.9 and a one-tailed alpha of 0 0.025 because it's a non-inferiority trial and a non-inferiority margin of 4%. A margin of 4% uh, indicates the largest difference between RADIS and POCUS accuracy that we determined to be clinically acceptable. Site recruitment occurred through what's called the P2 network, which is a group of pediatric emergency physicians with a special interest in point-of-care ultrasound. Uh, site co-investigators had to have a minimum of 10 intussusception scans uh, with at least one positive in the past. All sonographers were required to watch a video uh, that we developed through uh, sick kids up in um, uh, Toronto uh, that reviewed our study protocol and the ultrasound technique. And we also reviewed data entry with each site. Uh, I, I personally did that with each co-investigator, uh, usually via phone conversations and a combination of WebEx meetings and things like that. Uh, and we completed data entry using REDCap. Um, and a secure uh, URL was generated for data entry so that uh, other sites could send us uh, secure data uh, via that, that mechanism. We included children three months to six years of age. Uh, children were excluded if they required critical care or if they were transferred and the sonographer was aware of any ultrasound result from a referring facility. Our main outcomes were uh, POCUS and RADIS results. We further asked sonographers to classify an intussusception as clinically important, i.e. ileocolic or ilio-ilio, and to rate their confidence in their POCUS findings. Time to POCUS or RADIS uh, results were also collected. Time to RADIS, uh, excuse me, time to POCUS was defined as the POCUS scanning time from start to finish, and time to RADIS uh, was defined as the time of an actual order placement in the electronic medical record to the time of receipt of a read from radiology. Uh, we used these values because we felt that they practically represented the time at which a treating provider would obtain the information that they would need to guide clinical care. Uh, as of July 16th, when this most recent analysis was performed, we've enrolled 193 children across 14, uh, 14 sites. So since July 16th, we've added three sites uh, because COVID has slowed enrollment. Uh, this represents about 75% of our target sample of 256. Uh, the table on the left just shows some basic demographics. Uh, median age was around 20 months with slightly more males than females and uh, patients were mostly of white race and non-Hispanic ethnicity. Uh, the table on the right shows presenting signs and symptoms history and disposition. Median duration of symptoms was about 24 hours. Most patients presented with fussiness and parental concern for abdominal pain as you would expect, and notably only 22% presented with bloody stool. Six patients had a recent history of intussusception within the last 14 days, uh, and most were discharged home.
This figure shows the number of enrollments by site. Uh, as the lead site, we at Children's Minnesota have enrolled 71 children, which represents 5% of our sample. We did get started uh, enrolling at our site quite a bit earlier than other sites uh, to kind of take the lead. Uh, but for context, sites with 21 enrollments like at Beth Israel in, in, in Costa Rica, that represents 11% of our sample and those with only five enrollments uh, as of that time represented about 4% of our sample. This uh, flow chart shows a detailed uh, POCUS and RADIS results. Of the 193 children enrolled, six were excluded. Four because the sonographer was aware of results from an outside referring facility and two because RADIS was not performed. On both of those uh, patients, uh, the POCUS was positive, but the patient went right to the operating room rather than having an enema or surgical reduction. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what, uh, if that was just institutional dependent or, or if that was given the clinical context or in some facilities, they uh, may actually accept POCUS results and, and, and defer to uh, surgeons if radiology services aren't available like in the middle of the night, for example. Uh, so this resulted in a sample of 187 children for analysis. POCUS was positive for clinically important intussusception in 44 children. That's shown on the lower left. Of these, RADIS identified the intussusception as ileoileal in two cases and was negative in one case. And we classified these three studies as POCUS false positives. Uh, POCUS was positive for ileoileal intussusception in 12 children. That's in the lower middle. Of these, RADIS identified one as ileocolic, and this was classified as a POCUS false negative. Uh, lastly, POCUS was negative for clinically important intussusception in 131 children. That's on the lower right. Of these, RADIS identified ileocolic intussusception in two children who were also classified as a POCUS false negative. Uh, overall, the diagnostic accuracy of POCUS was high at 97% with a sensitivity of 93%, specificity 98, positive predictive value 93%, and negative predictive value 98%. Uh, interestingly, accuracy remained relatively the same across varying levels of sonographer competence in their POCUS findings. There were some variations in sensitivity and positive predictive values for competence levels less than or equal to two or equal to three. Uh, however, the samples in these um, the sample sizes in these confidence groups were smaller and more susceptible to change. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the time to POCUS and RADIS results, uh, where the y-axis represents the percentage of patients that would wait for imaging results, and the x-axis represents time in minutes. Uh, the median time to POCUS result was uh, about five minutes, compared to 64 minutes uh, for RADIS. And note that the POCUS time represents the POCUS scanning time here, and the RADIS time represents the time of actual order placement in the electronic medical record to the time of receipt from a read from radiology. Our study is limited uh, by convenience sampling of uh, subjects given the impracticality of training all physicians across all sites in POCUS bowel sonography. Uh, this tends to be a, a major limitation, I think, of uh, ultrasound studies in the emergency department in general as it kind of gains more traction. Uh, in addition, 35% of subjects were enrolled from one site, which may introduce bias and outcomes may have been skewed towards practices at, this, at our institution. Uh, in conclusion, POCUS appears to have a high diagnostic accuracy for intussusception. Can, it can be performed in a timely manner and uh, maybe a useful screening tool to guide need for dedicated radiology ultrasound. Uh, and lastly, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to present this research. Uh, and if there's any other questions offline, I'm happy to take them at this email address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Really, really appreciate it. Great presentation. Um, any questions for Dr. Bergman on this? So one question, in the false negative patients, what's the difference in outcome for those patients? 
Uh, that's a great question. There's, there's no difference in outcome uh, for those patients really uh, because all patients in the, our cohort did uh, have ultimately either a negative result that was correctly identified or if they had a negative result that was missed by point of care ultrasound, for example, they had a formal radiology ultrasound that, that ended up picking that up. I think that was in two of uh, the cases. And so there was no missed cases of, um, uh, of intussusception that led to any poor outcomes. Also, I think one of the issues is really de um, depending on where you practice, you know, um, sometimes the trainees are the ones that are doing the point of care ultrasound. Um, I was looking at your numbers, looks like, you know, a place like Rady Children's, for example, they would potentially be a site with lots of patients a year and they only um, gave you four patients. Is there a, a kind of a requirement for participation in you know, how many scans you have to do or is there any right. kind of oversight on that because they in my opinion I mean, that's a great place for you to enroll a lot of patients yeah too. unfortunately Rady uh, Atem uh, Uya is our co-investigator uh, down there um, along with Catherine Paid but they joined the study later I think it was around maybe February or March uh, so they joined the study later so they have a lower enrollment rate that are reflected there um, and I, I, th I think the main, that is what I think is the main issue with a lot of ultrasound studies and this in particular is uh, how do you get, um, um, you know, a lot of sites to, to really add uh, numbers as much as you can. And it's been kind of a rolling enrollment. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of left with. with yeah, and a lot, of, um, a lot of EM providers that are PEDS trained are not as, you know, I mean, not as used and accustomed to doing point of care ultrasound as the EM folks from the EM side. Mm -hmm. So for example, at my institution at Harbor UCLA, um, pediatric emergency medicine lives under emergency medicine and our home residency is the EM residency. So the EM residents doing ultrasounds on everybody that you know possibly needs one. So we get very used to them actually doing the first scan. They probably know more than I do. So did you have any kind of variation on who was actually the person that was doing the scans? Was it the, the trainees or are you using only attendings? Well, that's a great question. So we required that uh, this group of sonographers are more kind of quote unquote experts in the field. Most of them are pediatric emergency physicians who've had dedicated uh, training in ultrasound. Either they've done a fellowship or they have a registered diagnostic uh, medical sonography degree or an RDMS, which is what ultrasound technicians have. So we required that all co-investigators and sonographers have that. Um, that's because previous studies have focused more on novice users, which in some ways may be more practical, but I think as ultrasound uh, becomes more prevalent in its use, uh, I, I think we're gonna start to see a shift of more people becoming more uh, comfortable and being more quote unquote um, expert users kind of as time goes on, or at least more familiar with it. One other question. Did time required to POCUS significantly affect time to rate us? No, that's, and by that inference, clinical outcomes for your patient? No, that's a great question. And so we had uh, asked all treating sonographers to limit their, um, it, to be cognizant to that. If the, if, for example, if the ultrasound tech came into the room or if they were ready to take the patient to radiology for ultrasound, uh, that uh, they would be left with their scan at that time. And so, you know, they may be able to finish up, you know, another 30 seconds of scanning for a clip or something like that. But for the most part, I think that difference would be very negligible. Sorry, another question. Was radius endpoint based on prelim radiology read or final read of the ultrasound, or was there no differentiation? Uh, there was no differentiation for that. We used the timestamp on the dictated report from radiology when it came through the medical record at different sites um, because there would be variation across sites. Like, for example, we don't always get a call from the radiologist if it's, uh, you know, if it's positive. Sometimes they do that uh, just to give us a heads up, um, but not always, and that would be institutional kind of dependent. Thanks. I think there's one last question on the chat. Um, uh, David Kessler, bump was the first one. Can you talk about how you decided on two centimeter as cutoff for IC versus 
um, as opposed to, versus uh, one as opposed to a 2.5 centimeter. Did this play a role into the false negatives or positives? Yeah, thanks. Dave, I hope I read your question correctly. Yeah, I think I know what David is saying. And so um, for the, uh, myself and the three of the other main um, uh, co-investigators had kind of vetted the literature uh, beforehand Sorry. I think six or seven different studies that had looked at kind of what the most accurate cutoff was for a maximal transverse diameter in identifying iliocolic intussusceptions. Some go down to 1.7, 1.8. Some go as far up to like 2.5, for example. And we essentially took the median value of the six or seven different published reports and used that as kind of a middle marker. Whether or not that played a role in any false positives or false negatives, that's going to be part of our uh, write-up in our discussion as we kind of um, vet that more, but I don't have that data offhand right now. So, so Kelly, this is Kurt. I just want to congratulate you. It's very nice, and thank you for, for presenting. Uh, I do have a question about the when, when RADIS is wrong, and did, did you guys think about following these kids downstream, find, trying to identify the, the situation where you had, uh, you're, you're using RADIS as a gold standard, where, whereas, you know, it's, it, they're not perfect either. And a couple of ways to approach that, right, would be to have three different radiologists look at the scans, um, some things like that. But uh, it, it didn't sound like you guys had done that. I was just wondering, you know, this is an abstract. Maybe you did, and I didn't follow it. No, no, uh, you didn't miss that. I didn't mention that particularly, but we had one, um, we had one uh, case where the POCUS was positive for clinically important intussusception and the radius was negative, so potentially a missed radius. Uh, and there was one other case where the POCUS was determined to be ilioilial, but radius called it an iliocolic. That patient got uh, treated as usual. The one where the radius was negative, I, I don't have that degree of delineation uh, at this time going through what happened um, in terms of outcomes for that patient. The presumption would be uh, that there's always room for self-reduction of intussusceptions by the time they get to radiology or at some point. And that would, be, of course, be more likely with ilioilials where they are transient and you pick up and uh, less likely with iliocolics. Um, but that was kind of the working uh, presumption I had this time for that one patient. But that's a great point to go through and, and sort that out. We're going to move on to the next presenter. Thank you so much again for a great presentation, Kelly. Um, so our next presenter is Dr. Craig Newgard um, from Oregon Health, um, a national evaluation of emergency department pediatric readiness and outcomes among uh, U.S. trauma centers. Uh, Craig, you got the field. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I want to uh, also uh, recognize my, my excellent um, other, other presenters today, as well as the SCM Pediatric Interest Group um, for putting this program together. So again, my name is Craig Newgard. I'm an emergency physician at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. I'm going to talk to you today about a national evaluation of emergency department pediatric readiness and outcomes among U.S. trauma centers. I want to recognize my many co-authors uh, and their excellent work on this project. Uh, this project was funded by an R24 grant through NICHD. And there are many academic medical centers, state and national organizations that work together to put this project together. So a little background first, unintentional injury is a leading cause of death in years of potential life lost in children. Um, Based on this and multiple other factors, uh, there has been a national pediatric readiness program that has been stood up to improve the quality and capability of emergency care for children in the US. As part of this program and other studies, uh, it's clear that there's a large variability in the readiness of EDs to care for children. And in particular, for injured children, uh, EDs in US trauma centers are generally assumed to provide comprehensive high quality care. Um, there, uh, in fact, is a publication demonstrating that there's large variability in pediatric readiness among U.S. trauma centers. However, a key question that has persisted is whether uh, readiness is directly 
associated with outcomes and quality. That is, it's unclear if increased readiness actually improves health outcomes and the quality of care in children, which is the NIDAS for this study. Our objective here was to evaluate the association between ED, pediatric readiness, mortality, and complications among injured children presenting for EDs in U.S. trauma centers. This is a overall conceptual model. Um, and if I draw your attention to the left side here, so there's an injury event uh, after which a child is transported to the ED either by ambulance or otherwise. The initial ED caring for the child uh, can be scored based on their readiness to care for that child. And those scores can be ranked uh, in order of quartile. And those, child, uh, those children are followed through their hospital stay and beyond. Uh, looking at health outcomes and quality to really assess does the initial care um, in the ED as measured through pediatric readiness translate into better outcomes and higher quality of care. So to address this question, we evaluated data from 841 trauma centers, uh, levels one through five that participate in the National Trauma Data Bank. Uh, these centers are located in 44 states, and we used the most recent data we had available at that time from 2012 through 2016. We matched these data to the National ED, uh, Pediatric Readiness Surveys um, and focus on children zero to 17 years with trauma. Uh, the inclusion criteria for the NTDB are generally uh, injured children who are admitted to the hospital, transferred to a trauma center, or die in hospital due to trauma. And we also uh, linked state death records for five states uh, where we got permission to use identifiable death records and link those into the uh, NTDB. The Pediatric Readiness Survey, uh, this is a national assessment of EDs uh, from 2012 through 2013 throughout the U.S. and U.S. territories. Uh, this survey consists of 57 questions in six domains that I demonstrate here. And questions from these six domains are combined into a, a weighted score from zero to 100 uh, that is termed the weighted pediatric readiness score. And this is the primary measure that we use to quantify readiness across EDs in the sample. We collected multiple patient level variables. Um, all of these variables here are uh, predictors or, or confounders in standardized risk adjusted models for trauma. We also uh, collected multiple hospital level variables. So in addition to the pediatric readiness score, uh, we collected data on trauma center level, pediatric trauma center level, and pediatric ED volume. Our primary outcome for this study was a composite outcome of in-hospital mortality or in-hospital complications that are listed here. For secondary outcomes, we looked um, at in-hospital mortality and then among the subset of states that we had one-year death records matched, uh, we looked at one-year mortality. For the analysis, so first we used probabilistic linkage to link information for children that were transferred out of the ED. So for those kids that we had, clinical and readiness information from the initial ED, uh, we linked them to uh, the second hospital where they were transferred. We also used linkage to match uh, information from state death registries to generate our one-year mortality measure. We looked at three different key subgroups of children, all varying uh, ways of measuring injury severity. So I assess a 16 or more, a uh, AIS score of three or more, or children with a serious brain injury. We quantified this weighted pediatric readiness score by quartile at the ED level and used a random effects um, regression model with clustering on the initial ED to assess the uh, association between uh, pediatric readiness from the initial ED and outcomes. And we also conducted the multitude of sensitivity analyses to test these findings. This is our cohort creation. So of all the kids that were entered into the National Trauma Data Bank, we basically uh, kept all children where we had information from the initial ED, we had a matched pediatric readiness survey, 
Um, the only children that were excluded are those where uh, that information was missing, so we didn't have information from the initial ED, or they arrived to the ED without any signs of life, so children who were dead on arrival. Um, so children where we had information from the initial ED and transferred out, we kept all those children in. And as mentioned before, we used linkage to match information from the second hospital. So we tried to compile as much information as possible um, on those children that were transferred out. Our final cohort uh, included 312,790 children, uh, of which 46,650 were transfers. There were 1.7% of children who died during their hospital stay, 1.2% had in-hospital complications, and the composite outcome of death or complications occurred in 2.8%. You can see the percentages of the different subgroups listed here. So this is a histogram of pediatric readiness by ED, and um, I'll point out a few things on this slide. So first, uh, the range of weighted pediatric readiness score, the ED level is 29 to 100. Um, in this, uh, this lowest quartile here, 30% of those hospitals were level one and level two trauma centers. So a key point is that trauma center level does not track exactly with pediatric readiness. There is actually a span of levels across the entire spectrum of readiness. And these are scatter plots of uh, the unadjusted rates of outcomes by weighted pediatric readiness score. So whether looking at the, the composite outcome or focused on mortality or in hospital complications, we can see that on the left side of these plots, there's more scatter on the low end of the readiness scale. However, these data are unadjusted for all the other predictors and confounders. This is the key slide. So these uh, data represent our model results. And if I focus your attention on the upper left panel, uh, so we have the odds of outcome on the y-axis and uh, the x-axis is quartiles of readiness. Each of these quartiles is uh, being, being compared to the lowest quartile of readiness. And if we look first at our primary outcome, um, composite of mortality or complications, so children in the, uh, who were initially evaluated and cared for in the highest, in, in an ED uh, with in the highest quartile of readiness uh, had a point estimate suggesting a reduction in mortality or complications. However, the confidence intervals were uh, just touching one here when we look at in hospital mortality as, as a secondary outcome, we can see that the, the statistical effect is quite a bit stronger. So here this would suggest that there's a over 40% reduction in the odds of in hospital mortality among kids who are initially cared for in a high pediatric readiness ED compared to similar children cared for in a low pediatric readiness ED. Um, the other panels uh, are very consistent in, in, in their results. So whether we look at uh, these subgroups defined by an ISS of 16 or more, an AIS of three or more, or children with a serious brain injury, all these findings are very consistent. This slide shows the model results looking at uh, six domains of pediatric readiness. And there's one domain that stood out as uh, consistently showing a uh, reduction in, in, uh, in hospital mortality, and that was in personnel here, whether looking at the composite outcome, mortality or complications, or focused on in-hospital mortality. This slide are the summary findings from our uh, subgroup where we had one year um, one year mortality data. So in children who were in the five state subgroup, this is a sample of just over 40,000 children. We can see that first of all, just looking at the um, in-hospital mortality versus one year mortality, that there were kids that died after being discharged from the hospital. Um, and when we looked at the risk adjustment models that I've shown you already for the entire cohort, and then looking at these individual high-risk subgroups, we can see that um, there was one subgroup where 
there is a uh, persistent benefit that is a reduction in mortality that held through one year for these children being cared for uh, initially in a high readiness ED compared to low readiness EDs. And these were children with serious traumatic brain injury. These are our sensitivity analyses and uh, the top row here are the, are, these represent the, the results that I've already shown you. Um, each of the subsequent rows is adding other hospital level variables, so mainly trauma center level, pediatric trauma center level, and pediatric ED volume. And what we see for mortality or complications is that in general, the confidence interval is widened out a little bit. So it's, uh, these become kind of less um, uh, statistically conclusive as we add other hospital level variables to the model. When we look at mortality, uh, findings of mortality were robust uh, to um, each of these different sensitivity models, um, suggesting that this benefit held even after uh, putting in really important hospital level variables like trauma center level. Limitations here is that uh, this study was limited to children that were included in the National Trauma Data uh, Base, and so this represents a higher acuity patient population and is limited to trauma. Uh, it, it reflects U.S. trauma centers, so our findings may or may not represent those of uh, all U.S. EDs. We focused on in-hospital outcomes and looked at one-year mortality uh, based on a subset of states. In conclusion, injured children admitted through high readiness EDs had lower mortality than similar children cared for in low readiness EDs. Uh, and these findings support, we believe, national efforts to raise ED pediatric readiness among US trauma centers to care for children. Thanks very much, and I'm glad to uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. Thanks, Craig. So um, there was a question from Kurt. Um, thanks for excellent work. Did the high readiness sites have more complications? Yeah, excellent question. So we've gone backwards and forwards on analyzing the complication issue. Um, it's very tricky to tease out. Um, and part of that issue is that uh, complications mainly occurred in children that survived to have uh, hospital complications. Um, there was a, a higher, uh, slightly higher rate among, um, at least in the unadjusted data, um, sort of higher volume centers, bigger trauma centers, and those that had higher uh, pediatric ED readiness. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to disentangle the effect there. We looked at multinomial models, we looked at survivor-only analyses, and the gist of it is that the, the relationship between readiness and outcome is strongest among, uh, or strongest for um, in-hospital mortality. And we think that that is likely the fact that for children that die, uh, during their, their hospital stay, that tends to happen early in the course. So those are proximate events, whereas children that have in-hospital complications might be days or weeks later, much farther removed from the ED care. So there's a, um, a looser, a little bit more tenuous relationship between ED readiness and in-hospital complications. Good question, though. Again, so we, we had just just to follow that up, we had a very similar result when we were looking at traumatic brain injury in our Arizona uh, data set, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with, with where when we implemented uh, the, the uh, pre-hospital uh, EMS uh, guidelines, we had more people living, and so we had more complications. And uh, so it's a, it, I think that this is a phenomenon that you see as you improve readiness for anything, for TBI, but, but certainly for things that cause mortality. If, uh, you know, if the patient dies in the pre-hospital setting, you never see them. Yeah, so uh, thank you, I appreciate that. I just noticed that in the data, I wondered if that was the case. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, just a quick question on um, personnel. Um, under one of the six domains of personnel. Can you elaborate a little bit about what's characteristics of personnel um, 
you encountered in terms of variation between the different sites that was of significance? Yeah, so personnel, um, personnel uh, at, as is defined in the, in the readiness survey or, or the assessment is uh, actually has to do with um, whether the, um, it, really it's, it, it's not even, even the training of those providers, it has to do with whether they're um, uh, on an annual or biannual basis evaluated or, or tested on um, um, certain aspects of, of, of pediatric emergency care. And initially we thought that this lined up with having a, um, a uh, pediatric readiness coordinator, which has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, that's actually measured in a different category. So uh, since, um, since the findings that I sh have shown you, we added one more year of data and we're taking a deeper dive into those different domains to really try to disentangle what is the, you know, what are the primary drivers um, and, and could there be more focus on certain areas rather than covering all of them. So I think um, uh, we're still generating an answer to that question. Awesome, thank you so much, really appreciate it. So um, I'm gonna move on to our final speaker for this uh, session. Uh, Dr. Nate Cooperman from UC Davis will be talking about validation of the prediction rule for febrile infants under 60 days in a multi-center network. Nate, you got the floor. Great. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present at this special session, Mo. Really appreciate your efforts in putting this together. I have to say at the start, it's kind of fun to be presenting with uh, a handful of friends sharing the stage and also lots of friends in the audience. And um, it makes it feel very cozy. Just like uh, my youngest daughter had her bat mitzvah on Zoom two weeks ago, and it had the same sort of feel. Um, but with that, I'm going to talk about validation of a, a PCARN prediction rule for serious bacterial infections in young febrile infants. Uh, and uh, the presentation, uh, I'm sorry, the research was funded by having the same. That's well, there we go. Uh, was uh, funded by several federal funders, including NIH. EMSC program uh, and HRSA, and we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the risk of serious bacterial infections, uh, which I'll refer to as SBIs and febrile infants in the first two months of life, uh, evaluated in the ED is approximately eight to 10%. Most, as you know, are due to UTIs, uh, and the rest are due to invasive bacterial infections, de defined as bacteremia or bacterial meningitis. There are many risk stratification protocols uh, that people use to help stratify these uh, children into different risk groups. Prompt diagnosis and treatment uh, are needed for obviously those infants with SBIs. However, uh, lumbar punctures, empirical antibiotics, and hospitalizations really need to be avoided for those who are uh, at low risk. Clinical assessment of these infants can be difficult as Many febrile infants with SBIs may not be ill-appearing, as we and others have documented. There are many protocols for the evaluation of febrile infants, which typically includes clinical appearance, the white blood cell count, urinalysis. Some use band counts or the absolute neutral count, which I'll refer to here as the ANC. And CSF is required for some of these protocols. Many of the prior studies, however, have been suboptimal for a few reasons. Some have been small. Many have been retrospective, but probably most importantly, some of the models to predict the risk of the SBI were not statistically derived and they used predefined laboratory cutoffs and thresholds. More recent protocols that use newer biomarkers such as procalcitonin have increased uh, the accuracy in diagnosis of these children. Nevertheless, there remains substantial variation in the evaluation and disposition of the right infants, as uh, Prashant so nicely showed in his presentation. And I also have to mention, uh, as Prashant mentioned, it's great to share the stage with Prashant, uh, a friend for, uh, and uh, collaborator for the past two decades. So in 2019, uh, in PCAR, we published a highly accurate SBI prediction rule in 1,821 febrile infants who were 60 days and younger using three highly objective variables, uh, which determined the infant to be low risk. This was a negative urinalysis, an absolute neutral count less than 4.1, uh, 
thousand cells per millimeter cubed, and a serum procalcitonin less than 1.72 nanograms per milli uh, milliliters. Uh, we had a 900 of each in the derivation and the validation. And as you can see in the validation, the sensitivity was nearly 98%, specificity 60%, negative predictive value of 99.6%, and a positive predictive value of 20.7%. Uh, note that the CSF analysis is not part of the rule, and therefore lumbar punctures are not needed to risk stratify by this rule. <clears throat> there were no cases of uh, missed bacterial meningitis in that first study out of 1,800 patients. There were two missed S, uh, UTIs and one uh, bacteremia. We then uh, created a simpler, safer rule acknowledging possible overfitting whenever you create a rule. So we uh, rounded the ANC to 4,000 and procalcitonin to 0.5 to see what that would do to our rule. And actually, the sensitivity remained identical, and the specificity just went down just by a few percentage points. So this is the rule uh, we decided to go with and to further validate. So the objective of the current study was to validate the PCARN SBI prediction rule on a new cohort of febrile infants 60 days and younger using the rounded PCARN variables of UA, a UA positive or negative, ANC threshold of 4,000, and procalcitonin of 0.5. This was a prospective multicenter cross-sectional study in 21 PCARN EVs from June 2016 to April 2019. We included a convenient sample of infants 60 days and younger, they had to have rectal temperatures of at least 38 degrees centigrade, either measured in the ED or at a referring facility or at home. They were evaluated, they had to be evaluated for SBI with a minimum of urine culture and blood culture. And if CSF was not obtained, uh, all the infants had to have a follow-up tele telephone call to verify that they did not have bacterial meningitis. We excluded infants who received antibiotics in the preceding 48 hours those with critical illnesses, those with significant underlying illnesses or an obvious source uh, of infection, otitis media did not count as a source, uh, and those who were premature. Each patient was evaluated with the history and physical examination. They received a Yale observational scale score and also an, uh, an unstructured clinical assessment of risk of SBI by the attending physician. They all received a urinalysis an ANC, and a research sample for, pro for procalcitonin. The rest of the laboratories, including viral studies, again, as Prashant mentioned, were at the discretion of the clinician. <clears throat> the treatment and disposition of the patients were at the discussion of the ED provider, and telephone follow-up was uh, provided for all infants who did not receive a lumbar puncture. We defined a positive urinalysis as any positivity in nitrite or leukocyte esterase, or more than five white cells per high power field. A UTI was defined in standard fashion by either a growth of 10,000 CFU per milliliter of a catheterized specimen in association with a positive UA, a growth of 50,000 uh, CFU per milliliter regardless of the UA results, or a growth of 1,000 CFU per milliliter if it was a suprapubic specimen. Bacteremia and bacterial meningitis were defined by growth of a uh, known pathogen. And SBI was de defined as UTI bacteremia or bacterial meningitis, and IBI or invasive bacterial infection as bacteremia or bacterial meningitis. <clears throat> we evaluated the test characteristics of the PCRON rule for SBI using the rounded cutoffs. As I mentioned, the UA, ANC of 4,000, PCT of 0.5. We stratified the analysis by age uh, the first 28 days or the second month. We provide point estimates of risk of SBI and IBI with 95% confidence intervals. And then we evaluated the infants that were missed by the rule. So <clears throat> this is a summary of the characteristics of the 1,363 enrolled patients. About a third of these infants were in the first month of life. 40% were girls. Most of them had normal Yale observational scores, scale, scale scores, as was anticipated. And more than 95% had a clinician suspicion for SBI of less than 95%. So here's the results of the laboratory and culture uh, results. First of all, as one uh, would anticipate, 
the mean ANC was around 4.1, mean the median PCT was 0 0.1, and 14% had positive urinalysis. In addition, as all uh, typical previous studies on this topic, the SBI rate was 9.3%. And you can see that the, the rate of uh, SBIs was similar in the two age groups. However, the spectrum of SBIs was different. So in the first month uh, of life, um, there was about 6.5% UTIs alone, as opposed to the second month of life, where that was more like 8%. And the rate of bacterial meningitis, importantly, was 0.9% in the first month of life, which was higher than 0.2% in the second month of life. And as expected, uh, patients with SVIs had higher uh, temperatures than those without SVIs. They more frequently had positive urinalyses, substantially, as you can see there. And again, as anticipated, uh, the mean ANC and median PCTs were significantly higher in the SBI group compared to the non-SBI group. Now, the test characteristics of the rule overall were almost identical to those of the original derivation and validation studies. Overall, in the first two months of life, the sensitivity of this rule was 97.6%, specificity 61.1%, a negative predictive value of 99.6, and a positive predictive value of 20.5. <clears throat> the sensitivities for SBI were identical in the first two months of life, but the specificity was somewhat higher in the second month of life compared to the first, but did not achieve statistical significance. The prevalence of IBI, that is bacteremia or bacterial meningitis, overall was 1.8% for the whole group. Uh, and the rule was slightly less accurate for IBIs than SBI, as again, one would anticipate. But when we compared the first and second uh, month of life, uh, the rate of IBI was, was higher in the first month of life. The sensitivities for the rule were very sim similar. The specificity was slightly higher in the second month of life. There was one patient with bacteremia missed by the rule in each of the two age groups, but importantly, there was zero cases of missed bacterial meningitis in the whole cohort. So importantly, these are the three patients that were missed by the rule, and I'll just briefly cover them here. One was a 56-day-old male who had a UTI with growing two pathogens, Citrobacter and Klebsiella. Uh, and you, again, you can see by definition, Yale scores were all normal, laboratory tests were all normal. The second patient was a 17-day-old who had Staph aureus bacteremia, uh, who was admitted for IV antibiotics. The last patient was a 32-day-old male who was interesting. A patient presented very well appearing with normal labs, had a blood culture, and was sent home without antibiotics. At 19 hours, the blood culture grew um, meth-sensitive Staph aureus, and then the patient was called back to the ED for a re blood culture. He had not received antibiotics. Uh, he looked well. He had a repeat blood culture, which was negative, but they did an LP because the blood culture was positive. The LP showed 249 white cells. It was culture negative, and it was enterovirus positive. So this patient was likely a uh, contaminant blood culture with enterovirus um, meningitis. So the limitations to the study is that we enrolled a convenient sample. However, the SBI rates match previous studies done on the topic. CSF testing was not done on all patients. However, we uh, performed follow-up of all patients who did not have CSF obtained. And there were a limited number of patients with bacterial meningitis, but that matches the current epidemiology of SBIs in febrile infants. So in conclusion, we validated the PCRM febrile infant rule using rounded cutoffs in a nearly 1,400 infants 60 days and younger using three simple objective variables, a negative UA, an ANC less than 4,000, and PCT under 0.5. It was highly accurate, uh, matching the original derivation and validation. And now between this study and our original study published in JAMA Pediatrics last year, uh, there have been no cases of missed bacterial meningitis in nearly 3,200 febrile infants who are low risk by this rule. So the implications are the, the rule is now ready for implementation. 
Uh, this will limit invasive testing, limit variation in, in treatment, hopefully, uh, decrease antibiotic uh, treatment and hospitalization. But importantly, this rule is only for use at this point in the second month of life due to the increase in the first month of life, not only of bacterial meningitis, but uh, HSV infections, uh, 80 to 90% of which are in the first few weeks of life. And with that, I want to thank my uh, co-principal investigators and good friends, Dr. Uh, Prashant Mahajan and Dr. Ramillo, to all the PCORN site investigators and the data center, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nate, for an awesome presentation as usual. This was very informative. So um, looking at the chat, so one question, um, wonderful study and presentation, just curious, how many patients did receive LP in a study and of, in which age group, less than 28 days or greater than 29 days? Yeah, uh, Mo, so I, I can't see the chat, but um, uh, I'll just take it from you. Really good question. So um, as Prashant showed as a background slide in his presentation, in PCARN, nearly everybody in the first month of life receives the LP. But the range of LPs in the second month of life, which is really the main reason for the study, it's a, the variability is tremendous. Anywhere from 30% to 90% receive LPs in the second month of life. Uh, so the, the goal of the study is not only to decrease that amount of uh, sort of invasive treatment between LPs, antibiotics, and emissions in the second month of life, but to decrease that variability and follow the evidence. Um, and again, the question of how far we can push this into the first month of life um, is uh, tricky. We would say, I would say for sure not less than three weeks because that's where all the HSV is and this is not a rule for HSV. Um, and the step-by-step -step group uh, used the fourth week of life, but most of the patients the step-by-step -step group missed with bacteremia was in that fourth week of life. So I um, hope that answers the question. So another question, um, what is your suggestion um, of a biomarker in place of procalcitonin? Yes, so um, <laughs> it's a very good question because it's usually the opposite question that I get. That, hey, we don't have procalcitonin. I can't believe you're going to make us get procalcitonin. Uh, and um, looking for a newer biomarker um, uh, is a problem. I will say the CRP, this has been well studied, although CRP and procalcitonin appear similar in terms of identifying those with and without SBIs. When you limit it to IBIs, that is bacteremia and meningitis, procalcitonin is the far superior biomarker. And to be quite honest, it worked almost perfectly in our study. So I don't know how much better we can go. There, is, there are other biomarkers, progenal medulin and, and other inflammatory markers. But the next frontier is what Prashant and I and Octavio are working on is post-response, um, rather than a new biomarker, the next thing will be a genomics and identifying who's infected based on the host response of the, uh, of the person infected. That would be my guess. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay, let me just, something just popped up. I don't have my reading glasses, so I'm squinting. I apologize, give me a second. Uh, you have mentioned many times that HSV is important not to miss. In your experience, has the PCARN database been queried to determine any predictive factors to help identify infants with HSV? Great question. So um, we are doing uh, a study of um, genomics around a blood test. This is with uh, Dr. Um, Ramillo and, uh, and Prashant and I. Um, looking at the host response to HSV because that is something we have to um, get an answer to. But I am going to show you the data that we have on this validation set on HSV. So this is what we had in these, remember there was 1,400 patients. There were three cases of HSV all in the uh, CSF. This is how the rule would work in these three. And actually we kind of luck out. The first case was an eight-day-old, had a Yale score of 18. So this kid was very sick looking, had a normal ANC, but they did not, uh, they had a missing procalcitonin. So we can't talk about the rule, but an eight-day-old with fever with a Yale score of 18 obviously gets admitted. The second two cases, one was an 11-day-old and the other a 12-day-old, uh, and both of them had uh, abnormal markers on the PCARN rule. One, the ANC was, uh, 
I'm sorry, one, the Procal was elevated and the other ANC was elevated. So we, in, in this study, we probably would not have missed any of this uh, HSV. The problem is, is, again, the rule is derived to pick out bacterial infection and not viral, and uh, missing a child with HSV has potentially lethal consequences. So uh, my answer to that really important question is that hopefully in the near future we'll have a blood genomic marker for HSV infection, and that combined with uh, this rule can push down this rule to uh, much earlier in life without uh, telling you what that cutoff really will be. Okay, um, one quick question for me on this one also. On, the, on a positive view, when you consider something positive UA, um, you're looking at LUC esterase as an independent um, marker for positivity. In other words, if somebody has nothing but trace LUC esterase, would you mark that as positive or does it have to be more than trace? Well, yes, yeah, so good question, Mo. Uh, we define any positivity as positive, but as Prashant demonstrated, and that's why we looked at this and we're looking at each of those, you know, one of the nice things about the rule, there are three objective variables that can be pulled straight out of the EMR. And uh, we looked at what about patients who had a positive urinalysis, again, defined by positive any, uh, anything there. Well, if they're in the second month of life, as Prashant presented, there were 700 of them, and none of them had... Uh, a bacterial meningitis, so you don't need to do the LP. And uh, the other thing that uh, Prashant didn't mention, but we are analyzing, it'll be in Prashant's paper, if the urine was positive, but the other blood markers, that is the ANC and the Procal are negative, all I can tell you, I can't tell you the exact number because we're still uh, being analyzed, but the risk of concomitant bacteremia is extremely low, extremely low. So if you have a child whose uh, urine is positive, but their blood markers, or first of all, urine positive in the second month does not need an LP. And if it's uh, positive, but the blood markers are negative, uh, may not need anything except for oral antibiotics to treat their UTI and send them home. And that's an uh, analysis that's ongoing. Okay, thank you. All right, we have one minute to go. Any last second questions for Nate? Hey, well, let me just put offer something up because my good friend and former mentor, Carol Berkowitz, I don't know if you know Carol, she was the president of the AAP, she was chair of pediatrics at Harbor UCLA when I was a resident there and a very close friend. She asked about uh, viral bacterial co-infection. So I'm just gonna say one thing. Uh, you know, Prashant mentioned we have studied um, uh, concomitant infections and they happen. So if you have a, a viral infection, particularly in the first month of life, there's still patients with bacterial meningitis and bacteremia. The good news is the question I get asked all the time, well, if you knew the results of the viral study, how does it change your prediction rule? I'm asking a question for the crowd, for me and Prashant. And the answer is now that you know, we've collected um, MP swabs, comprehensive MP swabs on all of the patients uh, and blood will be done later. And we will be doing an analysis to see if you have the, a viral result, does it affect your, uh, the prediction rule at all or not? And we'll uh, report on that, hopefully, at the PAS next year. Awesome. So, Nate, just a, this, Kurt, just a comment that I've been reviewing all the cases in, our, in the, in the um, Banner Health System, which is several million ED visits a year, and uh, of kids that have COVID. And one of the kids had COVID and bacterial meningitis at the same time. So just yeah. a comment yeah, so about just, what you were yeah, saying. Let me, yeah, but let me, let me uh, uh, thanks Kurt for that, it's important. Uh, let me just make an important comment. And we have, uh, again, started publishing on this 20 years ago with an article about RSV, and this is what Dr. Berkowitz was implying. In the first month of life, there are uh, babies with RSV, with influenza, who have bacteremia, who have bacterial meningitis. In the first month of life, I don't alter my evaluation. In the second month of life, however, the risks start coming down, but they're not, uh, they're not completely mitigated, and UTIs are still quite common in kids with viral infection. COVID, um, we're actually doing a, uh, a study of uh, febrile infants with COVID in a PERN, this global database. We have um, uh, nearly 100 febrile infants with COVID, and we will be doing an analysis of this, but COVID is no different than any other viral infection. In the first month of life, concomitant bacterial infections 
happen, uh, as Dr. Brookwoods mentioned. So you can't let your guard down uh, on the basis of that. Super, super great presentation. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Mo, for all your hard work. And um, I'm looking forward to next year, like I said in the chat. Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Wonderful presentations. This was extremely informative. And uh, like I mentioned uh, in the beginning that uh, the plan is to have this entire session recorded um, and SAM will let us know where we can go find it. And um, again, thank you for all of you guys to take time to join us. I think at our peak, we had 96 people, which is a lot more than I had um, thought about. But uh, thank you again for all the speakers for your time. And thank you to all of um, our participants. Have a wonderful day, everybody.